I'd like to introduce a lady this evening who really does not need an introduction, but uh, someone I'm honored to be able to interview this evening, Ms. Bernita Gray. So I'm going to start right at the very beginning. Okay. Please tell us where you grew up. All right. Let me say, let me get this mic all adjusted here so that I don't blow everybody out and blow myself <laughs> out. Uh, my name is Bernita Gray, and uh, I'm a native of Chicago. I grew up here in Chicago. I grew up on the west side of Chicago. I grew up in a community called Lawndale. You hear about Lawndale now on the news. I used to, when I worked at 26 in California, get over to Lawndale every now and then. Lots of crack houses over there, drugs up and down the street, crime. It's quite a community. <laughs> <laughs> when you were in high school, your mother took a dramatic stand regarding your education. What did your mother do? Yes, she did. I had always gone to parochial schools, and I went to school in the 50s. And in our schools, you know, the nuns would slap you upside your head if you misbehave. Uh, there was corporal punishment. That, that was just a part of it. But unfortunately, when I went to high school, some of the nuns started using the N-word. And my mother was like, hell no. I know damn well I'm not paying for you to go to no school and have a nun call you out of your name. Now, she can't call you Bernita, then she don't need to call you. And um, the last time a nun called me the N-word, my mother took me out and put me in a public school. So, of course, once I got to public school, I then became a classic gay statistic because the kids around me realized that I was a lesbian and the teasing ensued and began. So I became one of those, a classic gay statistic. I dropped out of high school and went to work. Well, please tell us a little bit about your coming out as a lesbian. Uh, wow. Um, when I was in high school, in the shocking but true, I really looked a lot like Condoleezza Rice. <laughs> okay? All right, I had like page boy, not even like I had a real page boy. Got my hair done all the time. Always wore dresses, never wore slacks, never wore jeans. I always had on an A-shaped dress, skirt, mini skirt, whatever. In fact, when I came out, it was hard for me to let that go. I had to be a little eye magnet hippie lesbo for a while. Um, <laughs> that's just kind of the way it was. So I'm living on my own, and I uh, meet this great guy, Jewish guy, David, and we start dating. <coughs> and one day, David comes to me and says, one of my friends has no place to stay for a couple of weeks, and she's a lesbian, and could she stay at your apartment with you and your roommates? And I was like, hell no. I'm no damn lesbian up in my apartment. I don't even want to be bothered with that. No way. I'm like, uh -uh, no, no, David. That's, that's just taking it too damn far. <laughs> so I said, okay, I really love you. I'll let her stay for a week. A week later, I dumped him. <laughs> and she and I were making plans to go to Woodstock. Um, it was really incredible. Um, it was when people say night and day, my story is truly night and day. And since I don't work for the state's attorney's office anymore, I can just tell the truth. One of my roommates had gone to the California and had come back with some psilocybin mushrooms. She said the you know, we're, we're going to try these mushrooms one night. I said to her, you are such an idiot. I said, these are just mushrooms. You, how much you pay for these? She said, I paid about $40. I said, girl, somebody went to a Dominic's, dragged them out, and sold them to you. Don't be ridiculous. These are no hallucinogenic mushrooms. I said, a watch. So I started popping my mouth. And she was get it out. She's like, no, Bernita. Oh my God, no, Bernita. I'm like, girl, please. You know, they saw you come and they took advantage of you. About an hour later, I was dancing nude in the living room, telling everybody how happy I was. I'm so happy. I love life. Needless to say, they were all shocked. They were like, oh my God, Bernita. So they called my boyfriend to come and, you know, calm me down. So he comes over, Bernita, you've got to calm down and get dressed. I said, you can go to hell. I'm through with you. They couldn't believe it. They were like, oh my God, these drugs, this woman is possessed. She's a totally different person. 
we're gonna call the University of Chicago Hospital to come and get her. So they called, at that time it was called Billings. They called Billings, come and get me. They told them, no, we weren't sending an ambulance for somebody crazy on drugs and nude. You have to bring her in. So he was able to get me dressed and I told him, you know what, I'm not going nowhere with you. I looked over across the room and there was this beautiful woman there named Halle. I said, you know what, I'm in love with Halle and I'm through with you. Okay, so the following day when I came to, I was like, what happened last night? Oh my God, my hair was a mess. I was all sticky, I looked like hell. And one of my roommates turned to me and she said, Pernita, have you ever thought you were a lesbian? I was like, oh my God, not me. I go to church, I'm Catholic, I'm this, I'm a good girl, I got straight hair, blah, blah, blah. I'm not any of that lesbian type of thing. And um, I was a lesbian. About literally two weeks later, I dumped David. We had, you know, again, this will let you know what it was. We were saving to buy a house in High Park that was $25,000. Okay, and we needed 10% or $2,500 to buy this house. We had about $2,400, so we split it, and she and I went to Woodstock. And when we got to Woodstock, it was awesome because 499,000 other people had had the same idea of coming and hearing this hippie music and laying around for three or four days. But while we were there, in the middle of the rain, we saw these tents and tables that were set up with information about Stonewall and about gay liberation and about women's liberation. And when we left that dirty place, when we came back to Chicago, we swore that we were going to start a gay lit group here in Chicago. And that was the fall of 1969, so I went from being a nice Catholic girl with a page boy to being a total out lesbian with a fro out to here. Wow. Really. Change. Well, what was the FBI list? Uh, the FBI list was the phone number of my first apartment. Okay, so Shelley and I come back. She picks up a University of Chicago newspaper, and there's this guy who says, I want a gay roommate. So, of course, again, being the optimistic person I was, hell no. You know, that's some freak. That's some crazy person. Do not go over to that apartment and meet this guy. He's going to be a nutcase, probably a serial killer. Don't go. No, no, no. So I weighed all 120 pounds. I said, I'll go with you, and I'll protect you from him, just in case he's a real psycho. Okay. We get to his apartment, guess what happened? I fall in love with him. He was like the most charming, incredible person I had ever met. And in our conversation between the three of us, he said to me, he said, you know, 10% of the population is gay, Bernita. I was like, what? 10% of the population is gay. I knew that 10% of the population was African American. I knew that 10% of the population was black. I knew that 10% of the population was colored people. But I was like, if 10% of the population is gay, then where are they? I don't see the gay, I mean really, you didn't, 1969, you didn't see the word gay? I said, are you serious? He said, yeah. And I wrestled with that, I kept thinking, 10% of the population, that means all these gay people are here, but they're hiding? Wow, yeah, I couldn't believe that. And so, to prove him right, he, the three of us, uh, we, the gay group grew from three of us to four of us to 10 of us to Pat McCombs, who I met in that gay group back then in 1969. And it continued to grow. And then at one point, we had a dance at the university, and there were approximately 2,500 undergraduates and 250 people came to our dance. And when those 250 people came to that dance, I said, my God, Henry, you are right. That means we gotta get a gay paper, we gotta get some gay bars, we gotta get some gay life. We, what the hell, a closet? Get the hell out of the damn closet. I don't mean, uh -uh, never. Was it? So then I came out. <laughs> what was the FBI list? I don't think they got the F I'm sorry, the FBI list was my phone number. <laughs> when I moved into this apartment, the, the phone was already there again. Did you ever notice that the phones we had back, you know, for those of you who are a little bit older, in the 60s and the 70s, those phones never wore out? 
Right. Yeah. Anybody ever notice that? Weapons. I, mean, I had like a three hundred dollar phone that died after two years. And I was like, what? We had an ugly princess phone. I just slept with that phone. I talked on that phone for years. People called me on that phone. FBI was day and night. We put my number, how lucky I was, in the C newspaper and in the University of Chicago newspaper. If you want to talk about gay anything or go to a gay meeting, call FBI list, which was my home number. Wow. So people right would be calling my house day and night. I'm run away from home. My parents are beating me. I don't know where to go. Oh, come on over to my house. I'm leaving my husband. I figured I'm a lesbian. I'm leaving him. I don't know where to go. Come on over to my house. I'm sick of my wife. I've been married. Now I realize I'm gay. Come on over to my house. And so my phone number was FBI list for years. Uh, very easy to remember. And when I think back up now, can you imagine? Day and night, 24 hours a day when I'd be at work, that phone would be ringing when I get home. At 2 o'clock in the morning, people would be calling me. I'm ready to commit suicide. Now, mind you, I was in my early 20s. I had never had a social work class. I had a, you know, social work was just words. You know, I'm talking to these people. Oh, you, you're thinking of committing suicide because you're gay? Well, 10% of the population is gay, honey. So many gay people as there are black people. Come on over here, we're going to party. I'm not sure what a gay really is. So that's, that was my apartment, 5601 South Drexel in that basement was rocking for a good two and a half years. Am I right there? That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I had every kind of gay meeting. Monday night was coming out group. Tuesday night was this women's, no, Monday night was women's group. Every Monday night was our women's group. Tuesday night was coming out group. Wednesday night was another group. Friday and Saturday night were party groups. <laughs> Well, please tell us a little bit about your involvement in the Gay Liberation Movement. Well, actually, that's what that group was. We called ourselves the Gay Liberation Movement. And uh, it's really incredible to think that, you know, first there were three people, and then there were five, and then there were 80. And one of the incredible things that we did as a part of that Gay Liberation Group was to decide that on the anniversary of Stonewall, we would have a march. We were sick of being closeted. We wanted people to know that here in Chicago there is a gay community and we are not going to be closeted. We had buttons made up that said, how dare you presume I'm straight? It's one of our buttons. Out of the closets and into the streets was another one of our buttons. Um, and we were bound and determined because Chicago is a parade city. Every group in Chicago is an Irish parade, it's a Mexican, in fact, it's like four or five Mexican parades, it's a Puerto Rican parade, you know, but Billiken is the largest African American parade. Uh, so here we have all these ethnic groups, every ethnic group in Chicago, the Italians have Columbus Day, who have parades, and of course we have the outrageously crazy St. Patrick's Day parades. Again, we have two, two St. Patrick's, one on the south side, one downtown. And we decided that we were going to come out in the streets and say to the people of Chicago, you know what, gay people are here and um, we're going to have a parade. And so that was one of the things that we did as a part of that gay liberation group. Well, switching gears a little bit, please tell us about your work as a victims specialist. Well, that work, oh golly, that, that work came many years later. Um, one of the things, again, is I came out and began to see all the different areas where we did not have openly gay people, where we did not have openly lesbian people. Politics was one of those areas that has always interested me. We have all these senators, we have all these politicians, aldermen whose salaries we pay. They're our public servants, which means they are also gay and lesbian public servants. Uh, so I've always been interested in politics and supporting gay and lesbian people who um, want to run for political office. It was really sad when Ron Sable first ran for office, he could not get the response and the money, raise the type of money that he needed to raise to, um, to do the political thing. So as life would have it, politics has always been a part of my life. I owned a restaurant for many years, and um, when I sold that restaurant, I didn't know what I was gonna do. And, uh, a customer at my restaurant said to me, you know, Jack O'Malley, the state's attorney, is looking for a gay and lesbian person to work in for their office. I was like, I don't want to 
know anything about the state's attorney. I don't know anything about that. So uh, at that time, I'm not going to name any names, the guy who was doing the job was like doing a bad job. I'll just be nice to him that way. He was doing a really messed up, nasty, bad job. So they wanted to get rid of him. They got rid of him. And when they got rid of him, on the very last day that they were taking applications, it was a Friday, I said, I'm going to go on down and apply for that. This will let you know how long ago it was. I had to take my application down because there was no computer to email it. That wasn't happening. So I took it down to 26 in Cali. I was number 104, handed in that application, and she said, you're number 104. I think you're the last person because it is Friday at 4 o'clock on the last day that you can apply for this job. And I said, okay. And as life would have it, I went through the three interviews, and uh, State's Attorney Jack O'Malley hired me. Um, he was a Republican, by the way. Yeah. Jack was a Republican, and but he was the man. I give it to him. I really liked working for Jack O'Malley. He was very open to listening to me. He gave me a real voice in the office. He allowed me to create programs to go into schools and talk to kids about not getting involved in violence. He allowed me to create programs about GLBT issues, hate crimes, and bullying. So here I was, you know, what, 15 or so years ago in schools talking about ending bullying. Uh, Jack was a good state's attorney to me. The job was hard as hell, uh, the other parts of it, because I worked with gay and lesbian victims of domestic violence. I worked with the families of homicide victims. I worked in our domestic violence courts. Um, and again, when you're in a court, you don't just see your case, you see all the other cases around you. So that was another part of why I wanted to create some programs. Here in Cook County, and I'll just go briefly, we're one of the most serious counties. A 14-year-old who participates in a felony crime in this county can be charged as an adult and can be sentenced to the rest of their life in prison. So when I would see these kids in court on their sentencing who were 18, and 19 and 20 years old, sentenced to 50 and 60 and 70 years in prison, I was horrified. I, I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe the horror that I saw in the courtrooms, whether I was looking at my victim family or the defendant's family. And when Dick Devine came, became state's attorney, I said to Dick, I want to continue these programs, but I want to continue the programs in another way, as opposed to looking at crime and punishment Let's look at the impact on community and how community would look without violence. And so again, very fortunate, Dick Devine let me really create some very nice programs to go out in schools and talk to people, which uh, gave me real relief because the things that I saw in these courtrooms day in and day out, I mean, on any given day, we're two to three years behind in our work. Okay, right, so a 17-year-old who's arrested today and cannot make their bond is going to be held for two and a half to three years at 26 in California. Again, for me, you know, when I look at the Trayvon Martin case and I see, you said a $150,000 bond for a guy who shot and killed somebody? That's crazy. I mean, a guy here who, the idiot, who duct taped the baby, that was a $100,000 bond right there. A bond that is that low is not a bond for a homicide for a murder, or even an attempted murder. So working in the state's attorney's office for 18 years really changed how I see violence and the impact on, on violence on, on all of our lives. When we were meeting to prepare for this chat and we were covering a few topics, you mentioned an elephant in the room, mm -hmm. and that is racism. Yes. Please talk with us a little bit about racism in the community. Well, one of the unique things about our community is that we all come from different places. We all come from the communities that we grew up in. And so for a lot of people, I think when they come out gay or lesbian, it's the first time that you're really around Mexicans, it's the first time you're around Asians. There's a certain diversity that our community really has. But just as we bring the luggage of, you know, the kinds of foods that I like and the kinds of clothes that I might wear, we also bring the luggage of racism. Racism has been in our community. Well, racism is in our country. There's no escaping it. So again, when I came out in the late 60s, early 70s, the racism that was in the one or one, you heard me, one or two gay bars. I went to a bar 
I'd have to have my driver's license, my passport, my baptismal certificate. I mean, you know, I could never ever have enough ID. Now, what do you think that was about? And then there would be white girls behind me. They'd be like, ah, and they would walk right in. So the racism that has been in our community, again, that's the beginning. Last year, one of the sadder events that I went to in the community was a community meeting about the kids and the shootings here on Hostel Street. There were a good 400 men in that room who were so hostile about these young African-American kids that I can't tell you, it just really brought tears to my eyes. I mean, these are not serial killers. These are kids who want to hang out and have come down here because they're afraid to be in their community and be out. And so they come to what they see as a safe area. And then when they get to the safe area, people don't want them because of the color of their skin or because they don't have that kind of money. They're, they don't look sidetracked enough. They don't look straight enough. Even though you're gay, you've got to be a straight looking gay person. What is that? You have to talk in a certain way. Anyone in this room who has kids know that kids act out, hello? I mean, who, what kid does not act out? I mean, that's a part of it. You get to be 20, 21 years old, you want to go out and clown and act out and be on the streets. And so, yes, racism is huge in our community. I, I was in a gay bar one time. I'm standing here at the bar. The white bartender looked behind me, okay? He looked at my face and said, can I help you? He looked behind me to the white guy and said, can I take your order? Like, what? Okay. Yeah, I'll be back. Bye. And I left. And I have not been back. Yeah, I didn't spend my money there. Why would I go someplace to spend my money where I'm going to be treated like a second class citizen? I mean, really. Come on. That's, that's just not going on like that. If you, one thing about the South, and when I grow up, it's like whites only, just say whites only. Don't embarrass me when I get there. Tell me to show 22 IDs and a credit card. Don't. If that's what it is, then that's what it is. But really, it's, it's one of the things in our community that we've continued. You know, here we are in the 21st century, and we're still dealing with the issue of race. Whether you're a gay kid here on Halston Street or whether you're Trayvon Martin, the race thing is, is intense. A minute ago, you alluded to some of your political work, but uh, I'm told you were quite the personality at the 2008 Democratic Convention in Denver. So would you please tell us a bit about that? Well, the Democratic Convention, really, the real personality was my dear friend, Renee. I went with Renee, if any of you in the room know Renee Ogletree, I was part of Renee's entourage. Um, we, we had a blast. Again, I, I love government, I love politics, and I love a free party with a free cocktail. <laughs> what can I tell you? My mother wanted to go, she wanted to witness, as we all wanted to witness, the first African-American president being nominated. And um, Renee was a delegate, and so we packed up and we went to Denver. Since I'd already been doing politics for a good little while, I did happen to know a few politicians who were there, and um, we just, we had a blast. It was really, I have to say, it's really one of those times of my life. Um, you know, I, I would be at a, an event and Michelle would come in, Michelle Obama. It was just incredible. It was not only thinking about government, but being able to reach out and talk to those people who actually run our government, who are making the changes. So it's really been incredible. When uh, Barack Obama, when he was our senator, I served on his GOBT advisory. He, has a, he had a Senate advisory. And that was off the chain. Tracy, we would argue, oh my God, the marriage thing. He and I, in the last meeting that we had was nasty. Uh, you of all people, why would I want something else? If it's marriage, it's marriage. Why do I have to have a civil union? It's like it's a water fountain, it's a water fountain. Why you gotta have a white one and a black one? Do you have to have a Chinese one and a Mexican one too? If something, if it's marriage, it's marriage for everyone. Why would I want something less? Anybody in here want less? No. Who wants less? Anybody want less money? <laughs> less benefits? Oh, that's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm the same. And for me, as I've gotten older, in my 60s, gotten to the Social Security age, I, I want it all. 
because I've been paying taxes for a very, very long time. So I want everything that my tax dollar has paid for, I want it for me. And so, no, I don't want a civil union. I'll take that because that's all I have. But if it comes right down to it, no, I want a marriage. Duh. That's already set up. You don't have to set up anything different. I mean, really, you don't want a gay marriage, don't get one. You want a straight marriage, get one. And that's, that's, but the 2008 convention was, was fabulous. I had, a, I had a blast. And, and building on that a little bit, please tell us about going to the White House, hugging the president. Okay, yes, I'm very fortunate. Um, despite the arguments, I've been invited to the White House. Um, it was my privilege, really, the, the first time I was invited at Gay Pride. It was the day after our parade. This will let me know I've been gay for too long. Okay, it's Pride Sunday, I was working with the state's attorney. I'm like, oh, will this parade be over soon? Okay, golly gee whiz. I had the flow ready for the state's attorney, and of course, it was one of those days where I get to the float at 6.30 in the morning. Tell me if they didn't have the state's attorney's name spelled wrong. Okay. <laughs> Let's get a new name for the state's attorney, because if we had that name wrong, I won't have his job tomorrow. Let's get that done, because the following day we were going to Washington um, to go to a GLBT reception. Renee, myself, Mary, a whole group of us uh, from Chicago. And uh, it's interesting, we went before the Salahis, a couple that wasn't invited. So it's amazing when you're invited, you have a blast. And since we were invited, they allowed us to come in, and we were on this lawn, and we were all talking, and then we went into the White House, and um, we had a blast. We had a great time. It was interesting. Some of my friends were so nervous, they were too nervous to eat. I was like, are you crazy? This food is fabulous. They put this food for the president. I got the best shrimp bowl I've ever had. They had trays of champagne, and there were gay people from all over this country. I got to meet Bishop Flunder. I got to meet lesbians and gay men and transgender people. I got to meet the person from SAGE, which I can never remember what the letters stand for, so I call it Sexy and Gay Elders. Um, <laughs> there we go. Yeah, I, I don't know. What, what does SAGE stand for? What does SAGE stand for? Services and Advocacy for TLPT Elders. Wow. Like I said, sexy. <laughs> yeah, sexy and gay elders. <laughs> So it was an incredible thing. It was also incredible for me, having come out in the 60s, to go from being a dirty, hippie, crazy, you know, troublemaker, rabble-rouser, to actually be in the White House. It was really, it, it really said to me that our revolution is rolling. We, we're, we're rolling, and again, as part of rolling and wave and revolution, we're beginning. We're nowhere near there yet. We're really just at the early part of our revolution. We have a lot further to go. When people say, oh, this parade last year was 700,000, we've got to corral the parade, not happening. That is not happening because more and more gay people are going to be coming out. I mean, if you think of kids now in high school who know the words gay, in my generation, we didn't even know the word gay. A gay was like a happy whatever. <laughs> Nobody knew gay or lesbian or trans. I mean, we did not even have the language. So I think that more and more people will come out. Our parade here in Chicago will hit well over a million in the next few years. There's no two ways about it. Our community is going to really grow in leaps and bounds. More and more people are going to feel comfortable coming out. Closet will be, you know, as antiquated as Negro. Were you to speculate a little bit, what do you think is the president's position on gay marriage? Well, I think the president, as all politicians, <laughs> has his own personal and his own political. When you're a politician, you, you, you have to go with the agenda of the party. You can't just get up and say, this is how I want it, this is how I want it to go. You can begin to you know, start that change. I certainly, I, you know, I certainly feel Barack Obama is the best president we've had when it comes to GLBT issues. There no, there's no two ways about that. It's, it's no two ways about that. I mean, people can, you know, Bill Clinton. He's another Nobel Prize winner, but he gave us "Don't Ask, Don't Tell." I mean, he gave that to us. And everybody mad, Barack, hurry up, you redo it. Well, I got to go up behind this guy and clean up what he did. 
Once you're cleaning up someone else's something, that doesn't give you the time to create your own. And so, you know, again, he's at the beginning of this presidency, and there's a whole way as an African American, he doesn't even get to be president because he is constantly in a constant state of fighting racism. Again, it is not just here, it is so, I mean, the things, Barack could walk the water right now and pass out $100 bills and people will complain. <laughs> There's no two ways about it. And that those complaints come from the color of his skin. So my heart, again, to be the first black, any of you African Americans in this room who were the first black in your high school, or the first black in your college class, or the first African American to get a PhD at this university or that university, that's a very hard road. That's a very hard road to hold. That's, that's a hard one. My, my heart goes out to him, but I give it to him. He is the man. He, he does it. He really walks the walk. And he really is, um, he's a president that I'm really proud of. From right here in Chicago, I got to say, he's the real deal, as is his beautiful wife. <laughs> I'd love to be, I would love to meet her someday. She's just the epitome of class. She's the epitome of class and beauty. The last time I went to the White House, I went with Renee. And Renee was sick then. And we were in a room, we were at a Christmas party, and I know this will shock everybody, but I was chowing down. I was like at the eating all the so I was like, oh, this food is so good, this is the best peanut brittle. So Renee turns to me and she says, I really want to go over and give Michelle a hug. I said, what? There are like 150 people ahead of us. I'm going to get us some more peanut brittle and another glass of champagne. I'll be right back. I turned around. Where was Renee? Hugging Michelle. I looked across the room, that was my girl. She had made it through all these people. She was right up front, hugging the president, the first lady, and just chit-chatting and talking, and it just made me so happy to see her, and I gave her a little toast, and of course I ate her prenup bread. <laughs> <laughs> what a friend I am. <laughs> what is spiritualism to you, spirituality? The spirituality is very important to me. Um, Really, without spirituality, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here having this conversation with you. It is my spirituality that really uh, picks me up and gets me going. You know, the, the hard part of working, you know, in, in religions, other than Judaism, other religions, there's the talk of hell and evil. But when I worked at 26 in California, I, I saw hell. I saw the evil. I saw the worst of the worst. I saw, you know baby murderers, baby rapists. I saw things so horrendous and horrible in terms of child abuse cases that I wouldn't even want to say them again out loud. Um, so I need the spiritual because the spiritual is what picks me up every day. The spiritual is what keeps me in community. Uh, of all the awards I have, my most important award is my Human First Award because we're all human first. We all want to be loved, we want to be touched tenderly, we want to be talked to in a certain way. We don't want to be treated in a certain way. I spent um, some time living in a monastery in France, a monastery at Taizé, and that spiritual time, one gave me the time to pray for us to create this incredible gay community, and two, it gave me a time to really, um, to really get to peace and to know what peace was within myself. And since I was out at that time and a lesbian and a hippie, it, it, my spirituality gives me that, um, that spark of light every day. It, it, it's what keeps me going. I don't know quite how to say that, uh, you know. And that spirituality is in the lake, it's in the moon, it's in the stars, uh, that again, are over all of us. You know, we all see the same moon. You know, now somebody in Cancun right now is seeing that same moon on the beach and the heat, and I'm a little jealous of them. But the truth is, we are all under the same moon, and we are all under the same stars. And really, we are all human first. So my, my spiritual is, is very important to me. What do you miss about the old days of the gay and lesbian community? Wow. Well, first of all, I miss being able to stay up past midnight. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that, I miss that. I miss that. Looking at Kay, I couldn't even count the number of times that Kay and I closed bars at 3 o'clock in the morning, and then we went out to breakfast, and then we did this and that, and got home, you know, at 5 o'clock in the morning. 
Now, if Kate called me to do that, I'd have to call the senior abuse hotline. <laughs> Girl, please. I mean, <laughs> what's the question again? Look, I've got it. <laughs> I, I asked you what you missed about the old days. Oh, yeah, right. Oh, uh, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I, miss, I miss being young, of course. I miss that excitement that we all had to just be together. There wasn't a color thing. We were so happy to just be gay and drag queens and clowning and acting a good time and twirling and go ahead in this thing and do your thing. And you know you looking like the stud of studs. And it, it was a certain kind of freedom that we really had and a certain kind of camaraderie that we don't have as much now, now that we've all have a letter. Like, get to your letter. You and the G, get to the G's. You the lesbian, get to the L. Really, you the trans, well, we didn't have trans, but we just had drag queen. That was it, that's all we know. You a drag queen, she's a flaming queen, she's a drama queen, but she was some kind of queen. And as you know, we got to treat them like queens. Um, and so now we have that kind of, you know, and I think what's after trans, now we got questioning. What else? There are other letters. I can't keep up with all the letters now. That's queer, queer, queer. queer. Gender queer, queer that I can't <laughs> remember and keep up with all that. On the other hand, in, in seriousness, it is all of my community. And it is what changes about. But yeah, of course, I miss the same thing. I miss us just hanging out. The other thing, though, that I don't miss, I love it now, talk about politics that we've identified things as hate crimes. Back then, if a police officer caught you on the street and beat the hell out of you, you was just beat. There was no place for you to call. There was no phone that you could pick up the phone and call the police. If you picked up the phone and called the police and said, hey, I got beat up by these straight guys, blah, blah, boom, they would have even come out. So that I don't miss. I like the fact that now we, we have hate crimes and we call it that. What's the biggest misconception about you? The biggest misconception about me? Wow. Okay. I would probably think the biggest misconception about me is that I'm probably really butchy butch. But when I get home, I'm like Hannah Housewife. I'm always vacuuming and cleaning the house. And, you know, doing this. I get all the little decorations for Christmas. And, you know, I'm, I'm always doing something in the house. I'm a little Hannah housewife at home. Pat is just grinning from <laughs> it. Like, Go ahead, baby. Back of your little butt off. It's so cute. Uh-huh. Yeah. I am the Hannah housewife in the house. What's been your greatest accomplishment or achievement? My greatest accomplishment, achievement. Wow. Well, my greatest accomplishment is just being here and seeing... Um, Seeing my community come to a real fruition. Seeing gay papers. Seeing gay people go to events. Seeing Lambda. Seeing HRC. Seeing gay and lesbian people have children and have their children be a part of their family. Um, it, it, that's incredible. Again, yeah, when we came out in the 60s, there, there was no gay family. You brought the kids. People would be like, what the hell are you bringing the kids for? You know? So, I, seeing the incredible changes, even though I make jokes about them, I love it when I turn on my Facebook and I like to see the two gay men I know who have twin girls and they're taking the girls to the park and they're taking the girls to the zoo. I love seeing the lesbians I have who are out buying shoes for their girls. And it, it's really, it, it has been, that has been incredible. Seeing us go to the White House, really. You know, everybody else is walking in and I'm standing there like, you know, an old colored lady crying. My little eyes just filled up with tears. I, I feel like that I am so blessed in my life to see my life be both full and filled. That young people now can just say, you know what, I'm coming out of the closet. For all the people who laugh at, you know, the Kardashians and all that insanity, to see women's role has changed. Hey, I married a dude, 
70 days later, I'm not happy, Babu, I'm done. <laughs> really. The roles for women. Again, I grew up with a grandmother who never left the house. Her job was to cook and to clean. That was it. She was from a generation where she didn't need to go to college because women didn't need to do that. College, that was for men. Women didn't need to go to med school. That was for men. So again, I get to, as a woman, see how women's lives have changed. And I get to see women be newspaper editors and film editors and doctors and lawyers and have lives that are both full and filling. So I get to see a lot of, I've gotten to see a lot of incredible change. That which I probably, I'm really proud of the year, I think it was 94, when we marched in the Bud Billiken Parade. Uh, that was a real proud day for me because it was like bringing all of my culture together. The parade of my childhood that I had seen a gazillion times, and now to be a part of that parade, that was an incredibly uh, proud day for me. I was a little scared on that day, too, because people had called us and said some really mean things, um, but we did it. I'm proud on Gay Pride Sunday. When I step out on the street and see tens of thousands of people partying, it is beyond my belief in that that would ever happen. When I looked at the newspaper and they said we got a rain in the gay pride parade of 750,000 people, I was like, hell to the yes. <laughs> That's the way it should be. Absolutely, positively. And not only do we have this incredible parade, but we don't have any violence in our parade. We had 750,000 people. We don't have any shooting. We continue to be the least violent minority. They used to tease me at 26 in California because we had like a gang crimes room with pictures of all these gang bangers on it. And the, you know, the detectives would say, V, when are we going to get a gay crimes wall? <laughs> you know, you're decorated over there. I mean, I mean, think about it. There are certain kinds of crimes that you don't see a lot of because we don't want to go to jail. You know, that ain't a part of our culture being in a little room. You can't really rehab that or redecorate that. <laughs> I'm serious. Which is something that I feel I can bring to other communities. As a member of the African American community, I'm going to come to the Gay Pride Parade. I'm going to be in one community where we're going to party all day and all night and drink and fall over, and we don't have to shoot each other. So when I go into my other community, the African American community, where I'm at, I want to know how come we can't do that? So maybe we need to get some people from our GLBT community to go in the African American community and the Hispanic community because. When I turn on the news every day, again, think about it. You see all these kids who are shooting each other. When is the last time? I mean, we cry over a shooting here on Halsted Street like, you know, it's five mass murderers out there. But look at what the rest of our city is going through right now. Kids are terrified to go to school. Now, gay and lesbian kids are afraid to go to school because of other issues, of course. But yeah, I'm just very proud of a lot of the things that I've seen, and again, 750,000 people from 80 to 90 hippies <laughs> would never have thought that it could, never have thought it would happen that way, and at the same time, I'm, I'm very, very proud on that day.